All right, so I think uh, we are ready to begin. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to the Asthma Society of Canada's webinar series. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to ensure that everyone can hear me. Uh, if you can, can you please type yes or something into the chat box, which you'll find on the left-hand side of your screen. I'm just going to wait a moment and see. Excellent. I'm seeing some people um, are saying yes. So it appears that you can all hear me. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, so my name is Jenna Reynolds. I'm the Director of Programs and Services here at the Asthma Society of Canada. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us here today. Uh, before we begin, I would just like to go over some quick house housekeeping rules. Uh, firstly, this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the ASC's uh, YouTube channel and website for later viewing. Uh, you can contact me at any time to get that link or view any of our other webinars that we have produced. Um, secondly, all of the attendees are muted, uh, but at any point, if you have any questions, comments, or issues with sound, etc., cetera, uh, please type them into the chat box, um, which I'll be monitoring throughout. There will also be an opportunity to ask questions to Dr. Lemire during the presentation and again at the end, um, or mostly at the end for this presentation. So I will be collecting all questions and comments, so we'll be sure to respond uh, to everyone. Very quickly, I would just like to highlight uh, ASC's work. Uh, we are a national volunteer-supported charity that solely focuses on asthma and respiratory allergies. Uh, we are a small, patient-driven organization, but we operate nationally coast to coast. Uh, our main work centers on the missing gaps within the healthcare system, mainly providing education and support uh, for patients and their families, both in print and online. Uh, we also advocate to the Canadian government on improving health outcomes for all people living with asthma. Uh, a recent example of this was on the this, this successful bill of, uh, on Ryan's Law in Ontario. Um, this focuses, focused on safe access to asthma medications for children at schools. Um, we are now focusing our advocacy on national pharmacare, or access to medications, for fair, equitable, and universal coverage across the country. The ASC also um, supports research into better health outcomes and the eventual cure for asthma. Um, and much of the work that we do is through our community of volunteers and members across the country, people living with asthma, their families, parents, caregivers, healthcare professionals, educators, and others who are strongly committed to improving asthma care and quality of life. The National Asthma Patient Alliance is this free membership of volunteer Canadians who engage in all of the work that ASC does and helps to provide input, a voice, and grassroots support for our initiatives. And so, and lastly, uh, 2017 is going to be a big year for the Asthma Society of Canada uh, with the introduction of a much needed uh, brand new website with a community forum and also a rebranding of many of our programs and an introduction of new educational support programs for Canadians. So please ensure that you stay in touch with us as we engage and engage with us as we move forward. So now I would like to just introduce our distinguished presenter, uh, Dr. Catherine Lemire. Uh, Dr. Lemire is a professor of medicine at the Université de Montréal and a staff chest physician at the Hôpital de Sacré-Cœur de Montréal. She completed her medical training and her specialty in respiratory medicine at the University of the Mediterranean in Marseille, France, and her master's in biomedical sciences from the University of Montréal. She has obtained several provincial and national fellowship awards uh, from the Fonds de la Richesse en Santé de Québec and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the CIHR. Dr. Lemire also chaired the Asthma Committee of the Canadian Thoracic Society, the CTS, from 2001 to 2004, and she was responsible for the 2004 update of the Canadian Adult Asthma Guidelines. She currently sits on the Asthma Clinical Assembly as well as on the Executive Board of CTS. Dr. Lemire's research program is mainly focused on work-related asthma and more specifically on the assessment of the airway inflammation present in this condition as well as on severe asthma. She has published over 170 peer-reviewed articles in scientific journals. Uh, so Dr. Lemire, it is a pleasure to have, us, uh, to have you with us and thank you. Uh, and now if you're ready, I'd be happy uh, to pass the presentation over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Jenna. So, uh, so hello everybody, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I will try to, to have a presentation which is not too long so you can uh, ask a lot of questions. I think you know, the nice thing about it is that we can interact and I can try to answer your, uh, your question. So um, before uh, we start, I have some conflict of interest. So like uh, Jenna said, you know, I'm a 
involved with the Canadian Thoracic Society and I've been an uh, investigator for uh, clinical studies with uh, different companies. And uh, I participate as a consultant with the different companies too. So I've been involved uh, in clinical trials uh, with many biology and we're going to, uh, to, to talk about that uh, in a moment. So um, what the, the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to talk about asthma first, and then we're going to talk about severe asthma because we need to have a good understanding of asthma and uh, also uh, about uh, epidemiology called data on asthma before I can uh, touch about um, on uh, severe asthma. So um, asthma, I think what we need to, uh, to recognize now is that it's a very heterogeneous disease. And when I started my, uh, my med school, uh, we had this feeling that asthma was you know, one disease and was the same for every patient, and then we had one treatment for everybody. But, you know, the, the more the research uh, progressed, the more we realized that it's really an heterogeneous disease and that we need to move towards more personalized medicine to address uh, needs uh, for different patients. So that's a very important message. And then the other one, is the importance of airway inflammation in this disease. That's one of the most important characteristics of the disease. And it's not it's different uh, according to part patient. You, in some patients, you can have the type of inflammation and uh, in other, a different one. Um, so obviously, it's characterized by symptoms. So mostly wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough. And everybody on the call is, as I'm sure, familiar with those symptoms. And one characteristic is that these symptoms vary over time. So you can have periods where you don't have any symptoms, whereas other periods where you have exacerbation, uh, you become very symptomatic. And what goes along that is uh, uh, a variable expiratory airflow limitation, which means that there is airflow obstruction, uh, and we capture that by doing pulmonary function tests, and it's, um, it's variable uh, according to the time, can be normal sometimes, and uh, uh, you can get uh, severe airflow obstruction in other times. So just, I'm sorry, the slide is in French, but I'm sure you're going to, uh, to understand uh, easily. It's just a cartoon to, I think, that illustrates nicely what asthma is. So on the right end, you see uh, an, an asthmatic airway, and on the, on the left, uh, a normal airway. So there are two main problems here. You have the, uh, the smooth muscle, which is, you know, you see the bundle here uh, around the, the airway. So this muscle contracts, um, it's very twitchy. So when someone is exposed to irritant or cold air, uh, the muscle contracts and then uh, crush the airway. And the other problem that we have is airway inflammation. So you see here, um, the, the, the airway on the right is uh, really thickened. The, the airway wall is thickened. Uh, it's like the airway is swollen. Uh, there is a lot of secretion. And that's a view of, uh, from the bronchoscopy here. I, I don't know if you see the, 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 the airway on, on my mouse, but um, on, on the right, you see that the airway seems uh, swollen compared to the other side. So you have these two main problems, and we will see, we, we will talk about medication in a moment. The medication are going to address these two problems. So you have a, a bunch of medications which are bronchodilator uh, that are going to act on this muscle. And the other group of medication are anti-inflammatory medication like enol corticosteroid, and they are going to address the inflammatory component. So obviously, you know, with the airway uh, na narrowing and the, the twitchiness of the muscle, then it leads to these symptoms like uh, wheezing, chest tightness, a shortness of breath, uh, and cough. So like I just said, the symptoms are variable. Uh, and also another characteristic is that they are going to increase when people are exposed to irritant or allergen. So irritant can be a cold, it can be a, a strong odors like perfumes, um, uh, smoke, 
And uh, our gen, you know, can be exposure to cats, pollen, or uh, a variety of allergens. The important thing to remember is that all these symptoms are pretty non-specific. So, you know, in respirology, uh, every time we have something affecting the lung, very often the reaction is uh, you're going to cough, you're going to be short of breath. So, you know, it's, I mean, the symptoms are suggestive of asthma, but it really, really is important that the diagnosis is, is confirmed by objective measures. Um, actually, there is a, um, a study uh, currently that showed uh, that among a general population who had had the diagnosis of asthma within the five previous years, if we uh, perform pulmonary function tests, we didn't find evidence of asthma in 30% of the patients. So it's really important that the, the diagnosis is, is confirmed objectively. So how do we do that? I'm not going to go into detail into asthma diagnosis, but there are two main diagnostic tests. The first one is spirometry, and I'm sure you're, you know uh, and you're aware of what it is. So you, you blow into this machine, and uh, basically it gives us uh, the volume that you blow, especially in one second, which is called the FAV1. And uh, that gives you the idea whether your airway are obstructed or not. And if the obstruction uh, is reversible after the patient is giving bronchodilator, and there are some criteria for that, uh, we can make the diagnosis of asthma along with the symptoms. If the spirometry is normal, we can perform a provocation test, a methacholinylation challenge. Uh, the methacholine is a substance that when you inhale it, it um, it narrows the airway, it acts on the, uh, the smooth muscle. Um, and so it's going to happen in everybody at uh, a high concentration, but in asthmatics, this narrowing of the muscle occurs at a low concentration. So we are able also to do the diagnosis with this test. So, so once the diagnosis is confirmed, it's important to assess, uh, you know, what type of asthma do we have? So by performing our G test, to know whether or not the patient is allergic, and also recently becoming very important to know whether or not the patient has airway inflammation. And you'll see a bit later on um, that now we prescribe some medication according to the type of inflammation. So it can be made by uh, drawing some blood and look at the, uh, the eosinophils, which are a cell that is increased in many patients with asthma. And it's part of the airway inflammation that we see in asthma. So it can be done uh, in blood, or we can also obtain a uh, sputum cell count by having the patient cough up some phlegm, and it's analyzed, and it's really a good surrogate for uh, airway inflammation. Some people use also uh, exhaled nitric oxide. It's, um, it's a small machine in which we blow, and it gives a number. Um, it's a, it's it's an interesting proxy for airway inflammation, although it's not uh, as reliable. So if people have questions about that later on, I can uh, elaborate, but uh, you know, I'm not going to dwell on that for the moment. Um, so it's important also to know whether uh, the patient, as we see, is controlled. So it's not very complicated. So that's the asthma control criteria from the Canadian Thoracic Society in 2012. So basically, uh, if you don't have daytime symptoms, nighttime symptoms, if you asthma uh, doesn't impact your physical activity, uh, your work, you don't have exacerbation, you don't use uh, your, your Ventolin, basically you're going to be well controlled. But if you have regular symptoms or you use your Ventolin more than four doses a week, um, and you have sometimes exacerbation, that means to, that your asthma is not uh, well controlled, and that means that probably uh, your uh, your treatment should be uh, should be altered, or you know there are things that uh, we can do to improve the asthma control. So this slide I just wanted to show you because it's really astonishing for me. When I started medical school, we had two inhalers. So look at the numbers we have now. I mean that's incredible. So but you know. Uh, it's important that we don't uh, uh, stay impressed with this, uh, all this uh, variety of inhaler. It's not that complicated, actually. You have several class. 
So the first big class is bronchodilators. So that's all the medication that acts, acts on the airway smooth muscle and relax the smooth muscle. So, and you know, that's the, the Ventolin that I'm sure everybody knows. So you have the short acting, which uh, lasts for uh, about four hours, and the long acting, which are bronchodilators that uh, last for 12 hours. Um, the other class is more for COPD. I'm not going to talk about that, except that uh, for, especially at the emergency room, we use the Acrovent. The other big uh, class is the inflammatory, anti-inflammatory medication and the inhal corticosteroid. Again, you know, many, many different inhaler, but you know, mostly they are me too. Uh, there are some differences between uh, different inhaler, but I mean, the, in clinic, in clinic doesn't make a big difference. And then you have the association between the bronchodilator, the, the long-acting bronchodilator, and the, the you know, steroid, and that these are all combos um, that are used regularly, that's pretty uh, efficient. Um, so, you know, that's the, the, the big picture. Actually, so three big groups of medication. If we look at, that's the, uh, 2012 asthma management continuum for, from um, the CTS. So just to uh, give you a sense of how we step up the treatment. So obviously we confirm the diagnosis and then from someone who has very seldom uh, symptoms of asthma, we can just give Ventolin uh, or a short acting beta to uh, agonist uh, as needed. But then when the, uh, the disease is, uh, uh, is more uh, persistent, uh, then we uh, start with inhaled steroid. And then we can, uh, if it's not, uh, the, the control is not perfect using this medication, then we start adding medication. We, uh, we start with adding long acting beta 2 agonist. If it doesn't work, uh, we can add um, leukotriene receptor antagonist like Stangulaire, Montelukat, or increase the dose of inhaled steroid. But in some patients, in spite of having added all this medication, people remain symptomatic and, and have exacerbation. That's where we introduce uh, biologic when we can. Uh, so it can be the Xoler or now the Nucala or soon the, the Sinquare. So I'm going to, chat, to, to speak about that later. And you know, in some patients, we have to give prednisone oral steroid uh, all the time. We try to avoid it because there are a lot of side effects, but sometimes there is no chance. So um, for severe asthma, you know, we are in this zone uh, of uh, biologic and prednisone, and I'm going to, to speak about that in more detail in a moment. So just a bit, uh, some statistics. So then uh, you have, uh, I think, that, that, that uh, makes in perspective the data on severe asthma. So as you know, the asthma is a very prevalent disease. So um, if you look at Statistics Canada, usually it's uh, around 8%. These are data from the Terrizato in Ontario. And you see that there is a rise in prevalence of asthma and the less data was 14%. But you know, it's, I mean, data on statistics on asthma really depend on the definition that was done in an administrative database. And the good news, it seems that the incident, the new cases, seems to decrease a bit, but still a very, very frequent disease. If we look at the healthcare utilization, so uh, the, the, the number of time people go to the emergency and bring are hospitalized for asthma or just go to the physician, you see that the um, ED visit and hospitalization really decrease uh, in the year, but there are still you know, a number of patients who still go to the emergency for their asthma. So we do better, but it's not perfect yet. And you see that you are still people dying from asthma. So although it decreased, it has decreased um, really markedly in the last one year, we still have uh, a portion of patients who still die from, from asthma. Uh, if you look at severe asthma exacerbation, again, so the definition was multiple EDVZ, hospitalization, or ICU admission. We see that although there was a decrease in the past year, there are still a number of patients who really have severe exacerbation. In terms of cost, 
um, you see that that's data from the uh, from British Columbia. Uh, you see that over the years, in, in spite of the increase of the prevalence of the disease, uh, the cost increased a bit, but not that much because the, the um, hospitalization and the physician visit decreased a bit. But that's going to be replaced by the medication that are quite costly. So you see here that over the years, there was a big increase in medication, whereas the physician visit and the hospitalization decreased. So now we are going to, uh, to go into uh, severe asthma. So what is severe asthma first? It's not very complicated. Severe asthma, we, call, we can also call it as difficult to treat asthma. It's someone who takes an optimal, quite high medication for asthma with combination therapy, in our corticosteroid, long-acting beta-2 agonist or leukotriene antagonist, and use quite often a course of systemic oral steroids. And in spite of that, they are still uncontrolled. So they have exacerbation, they have symptoms, they wake up at night, they use that bantolin in spite of this medication. So that's what we consider as severe asthma. So before we call someone and we think someone has severe asthma, we need to check several things because when we, we often have patients uh, who are referred uh, to us for severe asthma and then when we see them, we realize that they are not necessarily severe, but sometimes you know, they still have some people have really poor inhaler technique. Um, they don't take their medication, and that's extremely frequent. Uh, we, are, we know that in asthma, the adherence to treatment is, is really bad, and uh, I don't know why, but people don't like taking inhaler or forget to take their inhalers. Um, so that, that, that's certainly a big problem. And we need to make sure of the diagnosis of asthma, like I said before. Uh, sometimes it's not asthma, that's why it doesn't respond to medication. So we need to do a comprehensive investigation. And sometimes uh, people with asthma have uh, also other diseases like rhinosinusitis, gastroesophageal reflux, um, and sleep apnea. So that needs to be considered because if we don't really treat these comorbidities, it's going to be difficult to have a good control of asthma. And there are people who are allergic to, uh, to, to products. For example, people at work, the, the, the best example is a baker that's exposed to flour and has asthma. If the patient is not removed from exposure, the asthma is going to be very difficult to control and can be severe. So it's important that we look at the environment and uh, address these issues before calling someone uh, as severe. So what about the, the prevalence of severe asthma? So I showed you the data uh, in, uh, in asthma, so let's say 8 to 14 percent of the population. And so how many patients have, have severe asthma? So it's difficult to know exactly because it varies according to the definition chosen. Here it was a study where the definition was according to the symptoms. So if the patient has really uh, a lot of symptoms at night, uh, on the daytime, or using a, their inhaler uh, very frequently, they were called as severe. And that was done by questionnaire in different countries. And if we looked at the United States, which probably have the closer to us, to us you see that 19% of in this population of asthmatic people uh, had severe asthma. There are other studies that look at the same thing. It was done in Quebec looking at administrative database, so a different definition looking at exacerbation and the level of medication. And here it was 14%. And you know, it was compared with um, other cohort with other definition, but you know, basically it varies between 10 to 20%. 20% is probably um, a bit uh, a bit uh, too loose, but I would say probably. 15% uh, uh, is probably a good number. So, you know, 15% of, of asthmatic having severe asthma in a, in, a, uh, in a disease that is very prevalent, that means that there are a lot of people with severe asthma. So, the thing is, if you have severe asthma, usually your asthma is not well controlled. And that's uh, another 
part of this study that uh, was done in Montreal showing that you know 93% of the patients who had severe asthma uh, was uncontrolled. That was in our clinic, but even in the large database, uh, the RAMQ database, most patients with severe asthma are not controlled. In terms of cost, we know that if you are not controlled, you're, that's where the costs are uh, the most important. So uh, that's the same data uh, performed in uh, British Columbia. So we, we see here the reputation. So uh, mainly the patients who are severe are, uh, are, are uncontrolled. Uh, but even some, sometimes pe people with milder asthma can be uncontrolled, and that really drives the, the cost, medication and, and physician visit or uh, hospitalization. So now we also uh, really look at the indirect cost. That was the direct cost I just showed you. The indirect cost is the cost of absenteeism when someone cannot work and the cost related to loss of production. For example, someone is at work, has asthma, so is not able to perform uh, the, the task the person is supposed to, to, to do optimally. So the productivity is less. So there are means to, to measure this kind of thing. And that was a Spanish study looking at uh, the direct and the indirect cost um, in mild to severe asthma. In the severe asthma, the, ESP, the SPA column, you see that um, the indirect costs uh, were substantial. So that was per month. The, here, the direct cost was for three months. So it was as high, the indirect and direct cost was as high uh, for an amount of more than 1,000 per person. So we did the, um, the same thing, well, not the same thing, but the same type of study uh, in Quebec, and just to show you uh, the, the, the numbers. So we looked at uh, uh, a number of patients that we are, are following at uh, our clinic, and we looked at the cost related to uh, the, the healthcare service use, so the medical visit, ED visit, and hospitalization. And you see that, as expected, uh, it's, the costs are higher when uh, people are not controlled. But it's not, ha it's not that high for um, healthcare uh, service use. But when we look at medication, you see that really medication drives the cost. So depending on the severity of the disease, so mild asthma, uh, so it's per, um, uh, that was uh, per month, I think. Um, so $112, and you know, for the very severe patient, uh, it was much higher. Um, and the same thing for the control. The, if you are really uncontrolled, it's going to cost more in medication. That's not surprising. And if you will look at the uh, indirect cost, the absenteeism, presenteeism, per three months, it cost $201. So, you know, it's less than the medication, but it's still uh, a substantial cost. So we see that, uh, again, severe asthma is prevalent and it's costly. So I'm just going to want to share with you uh, what is for me severe asthma uh, in clinic, and uh, it's um, it's really a real patient that I'm following, uh, and just to show you how uh, severe it can be. So um, it's a, a young man, 30 year old male, never smoker. He had oops, I've been disconnected. Um, Jenna, can you hear me? I mean, I can't, I don't see the, uh, I yes, I, I, can't, I can't see anything anymore. Oh, I've, I've been disconnected. And, okay. Uh, Sorry, everyone. So, We're having a quick technical difficulty. But you know what? Yeah. Did you lose, uh, did you accidentally exit? The no, I didn't exit. It's just uh, it seems that I lost the connection. Okay. 
Um, um, everyone can hear you, so you're you're still on on the phone. Yeah. So okay. So I can't carry screen. on. I don't see the slides, but I can't carry on. So if you know, um, so, yeah, I will I advance can, uh, the slides for you then. Okay. But, uh, I won't know you by heart, but so the uh, I think it's coming back. You're coming back on. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Uh, this is what happens with technology on occasion. Oh, okay. Um, it's back. Good. You're back. So, All right. Wonderful. Yeah. It's back. Sorry about that. So, <laughs> Not so a problem. He, Thank he you, had, everyone. Um, he had asthma when he was 15, and he has been taking uh, oral steroid for eight years. You know, which is a long time. So he's atopic. He has sinusitis, and he had inflammation uh, in his airway. So that's the different treatment he was taking. So high, very high dose of or in all corticosteroid, uh, combo therapy, he had uh, uh, lancotrien inhibitor, theophylline, prednisone, and we tried uh, omalizumab. I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but it was ineffective and we had to stop it. And he had multiple exacerbation, uh, you know, uh, the, it was in 2014, but it was the same the, the last year, and with my major, major side effects, osteoporosis, cataract, you know, at a very young age. So when we have a patient severe like that, and he was very adherent to this medication, so that's where we really need additional treatment to address these kind of cases where, you know, they are very difficult to treat. So what can we do now uh, for, you know, severe cases uh, like this one? So I told you at first when we were talking about asthma definition that asthma was an heterogeneous disease. So that means that everybody has different characteristics. So we knew about that for a long time, and that's uh, in 2006, um, that was a, an article uh, which was reporting the different subtype of asthma we could encounter. So, you know, depending on the severity, depending on the patient who are exacerbated or not, depending on the characteristics of the pulmonary function test, depending on the response to treatment, or depending uh, on the triggers. If there are people who are intolerant to aspirin, there are people who are allergic to different irritant, uh, allergen, or are exposed to irritant, uh, who are really uh, uh, sensitive when they do exercise, and there are people who have different types of inflammation. So more, a bit more uh, recently, it was realized that all these subgroups uh, was so that we called phenotypes, had actually an underlying physiopathology of the disease which was different. And now we are moving from phenotype to what we call endotype, which is more the mechanism of the disease uh, underlying uh, the disease in this patient. And it's important because it has uh, the repercussion that is going to, we're going to have different treatment for those patients. So there was a, a recent, quite recently a guideline on severe asthma. And you know what they were emphasizing is that depending on the type of asthma you had, depending on the inflammation that can be different, or if you have airflow obstruction or the recent exacerbation, we can have a treatment that are specifically targeted uh, towards these different subgroup. So the more recent um, uh, characterization, I would say, is that we now differentiate asthma into big group, uh, what we call TH2 high or low, so it doesn't matter what exactly it means. Uh, I wouldn't go into detail, but what it means basically is that you have one group which is usually more allergic, who has more inflammation and eosinophilic inflammation. And for this group, we have different biologic targets that are used at the moment. And we can identify these groups by doing different things. So like I said, uh, looking at eosinophils in the blood and sputum, or also looking at exiled, um, exiled nitric oxide. There is another type, which is called TH1, or low uh, TH2, uh, where the inflammation is different, and we don't have a lot of 
biologic target at the moment. The, there was some trials in this population, but we don't have a good prospect in terms of medication for the for the moment. So you know we're going to concentrate more uh, with the new medication uh, on the TH2 high. So the way we were doing and we were managing asthma before, and we still do, is that we make a diagnostic, we assess the severity of asthma, we look at the triggers, the comorbidities, and then we start with one treatment, and if it doesn't work, we increase the treatment. But now we tend to have a more personalized approach. So we try to understand more which type of asthma, and um, then depending on the biomarker we that is increased and we have, we are going to really tailor the therapy, the therapy uh, depending of the uh, what biomarker is increased. So I think that's really the future. So we hadn't gone into the, the genes yet, but you know that in the future that's possible that we are going to realize that this gene uh, is going to respond more to this type of medication. So what is now the, the treatment more specific for severe asthma? I showed you before, you know, the, uh, the general treatment for asthma, but now we go into uh, more the biologic treatment of asthma. So currently we have three medications that are, uh, that are approved, which are, is the, the omolazumab. Uh, the omolazumab, the Oxolair, has been used like for 10 years already. But the new one is the Mepolizumab, uh, which has been released in March, uh, at least here in Quebec. I don't know in the other provinces, probably the, around the same time. And a new one, uh, which has been recently approved, which is the Rislizumab. So both of these molecules target a molecule that is called IL-5, and IL-5 uh, attracts the eosinophils on the site uh, in the airways. So if you antagonize IL-5, so you're going to decrease the number of eosinophils, you're going to decrease the survival of eosinophils, and you're going to really decrease the inflammation. For the Xolair, it targets the IgE, which are the antibody for the allergy, if you will. So it's really targeted more uh, towards people who have uh, really a uh, lot of allergies with high level of IgEs and, and also allergies to different uh, uh, different allergens. So, but there is an overlap in these two treatments uh, because sometimes the, the patients have, bo have both the characteristics of allergic and eosinophilic inflammation. Uh, Baralizumab is also an anti IL5 that targets the receptor of the drug. So, it's not on the market, uh, but it's going to be quite potent and it's going to be released probably in the, maybe next year. The dupilumab, uh, again, it targets an, uh, uh, another type of cytokine, but you know it's the, the, the same principle. It's going to antagonize the uh, IL-5 and uh, IL-4 and IL-13. Uh, it's just it's under development. It seems very promising, but uh, you know it's not uh, it's not going to be released uh, before a few years. Uh, Liglimizumab, which was a, like a super Xolair, I think it's not going to happen for 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 this one. And the anti r 13 I'm not sure either. I mean, the, there are some results that was a bit disappointing, so I'm not sure that the, the research I'm going to uh, carry on for for those drugs. But for the moment, I'm just going to to um, to focus on those uh, which are on the market, which are the mepolizumab, resizumab, and omalizumab. So that's just um, I was uh, I was saying the difference between this biologic therapy and the other medication is that those therapy are either subcutaneous or intravenous. So that's the difference. It's not uh, inhaled uh, or oral. It's uh, really systemic medication. And it has, it's administered once a month, and for some of them, the Xolair can be uh, twice a month. So uh, the Xolair, so it's uh, intended for severe allergic asthma. You have to have positive skin prick tests and high Ig level, and it's really targeted towards patients who have frequent asthma exacerbation. You're not going to give that to uh, really people with mild asthma. They need to be uh, adherent to medication. 
So like I said, it's um, uh, one or two injection monthly. Usually it's very well toler tolerated, but there are some cases of um, anaphylaxis that were reported, but it's, it's, really, uh, it's really rare. Usually that's uh, quite well, well tolerated. Um, now the other one, uh, the more recent one, uh, which is called Nutella, uh, then the population is a bit different. It's also for people having severe asthma, they need to have had at least two asthma exacerbation in the previous year, and they need to be treated with high dose of phenylsterine and long acting uh, beta agonist, and they need to have high but not necessarily high, what we call high, because it's still in the, within the normal limit, but they need to have um, blood eosinophil count. And I'm sorry, there is a, a mistake here. It's 0 0.3, 10 to 9, or 300 micro, 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 microliter. Uh, so sorry, the unit is wrong. Uh, or 150 at the time of the visit. And that's an administration one monthly, and it's an, uh, a unique dose. Again, very well tolerated. For the moment, they didn't have any uh, allergic cases. For, and the last one, which is the Sanker, which is going to be released uh, probably pretty soon. Uh, the criteria is a bit are a bit different. It's uh, one asthma exacerbation in the previous year. Um, and the blood eosinophil count, again, the unit is wrong, I'm sorry, is, um, is more than 400 uh, micro cells per liter. Uh, cells per microliter, sorry. So it's a higher count of eosinophil, but it's just one exacerbation in the previous year. Uh, there were also some uh, rare cases of anaphylaxis that were reported. But basically, this, this treatments are well tolerated usually uh, and pretty efficient. Um, so the, the, the problem uh, with the, the Sanker is that it's, uh, it's an IV administration uh, once a year, once a month. So IV, you know, that's, uh, that's not ideal, especially every month, uh, but uh, it could be an alternative in some, um, in some cases. So I think it's really, uh, uh, exciting times because we didn't have well, we didn't have much to offer for uh, this population and it's changing and there are you know many different uh, molecules into development at the moment for for TV asthma so um, so it's uh, it's really positive so what this medication do so they reduce the, the main effect of this medication is really to reduce exacerbation and all do that uh, pretty effectively uh, so they reduce the asthma symptoms and in of medication the improvement of lung function is less constant it can be small sometimes there is not uh, a big improvement in lung function um, so it's not the, really the goal of the medication. The goal of the medication is really to decrease the, the frequency of the exacerbation. It has also, uh, for the mepolizumab and probably for the resfizumab, what we call a corticosparing effect. So people who are on oral steroid, we can reduce the dose, and in, in some people we can stop the prednisone uh, when the patient takes the medication, and it, it improves the quality of life. So, uh, you know, Finally, I think, you know, just to, to wrap up, I think uh, what's important to remember is that asthma is a very prevalent disease, and even if severe asthma uh, is only, uh, let's say, 15% of the cases of asthma, that represents many, many people. Um, and I think uh, now we're going to move into personalized medicine and try really to tailor the treatment according to the characteristic of the patient and probably being uh, more effective in, uh, in, our, uh, in our treatment. So uh, now I can answer the question. Uh, uh, yeah, excellent. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lemire. That was uh, an excellent uh, presentation. Um, so we do have uh, several questions for you that I can start with. Again, for anyone that has any 
more questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box and we will get to them. Um, so, Catherine, the first question that I have is from Samantha from Ontario. So she asks, I have severe asthma and I have received Zolaire injections since 2000 and I'm currently taking a break to my concerns of severe weight gain. My respirologist feels that the weight gain is not a result of the Zolaire. However, there are hundreds of online comments asking the same question. I'm currently off work and my latest spirometry tests are holding steady since I have not been exposed to the irritants at work. Is there any information linking Zolaire or biologics to weight gain? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, the thing is, you know, it depends also if uh, uh, there are still treatment uh, with the uh, course of uh, oral steroids sometimes, you know, that kind that, that really uh, can affect the weight. But for the Xolar itself, I, you know, haven't heard anything about weight gain and um, and Xolar. And it's just, you know, the, me the, the, the mechanism of the drug is a bit improbable because it's really target IgE. So I don't really see how it would work. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, excellent. So another question from Dia from Toronto. What about the fanfare from uh, Dupilamab? Am I pronouncing that wrong? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Is it really targeted to be revolutionary? Yeah, Dupilamab, the, the data that we have uh, at the moment are very promising, but it's really, it's still a bit early. Uh, we are in the uh, the phase three trial, so yeah, the the data that we have uh, showed quite an uh, an impressive effect. But you know, we need to be cautious because sometimes you know it seems unbelievable. And for example, there are all other drugs like anti TSLP medication uh, that are have really really impressive. Um, early results, but sometimes, you know, when it's tested on larger population, less selected, the effect is not as bright. So we, I think we just need to wait and see. Great, thank you. And a question from Carmela. What tests should patients undergo if severe asthma and COPD overlap syndrome is suspected? What, sorry, I didn't hear the second word. What? I didn't hear. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you um, the question? Of course, sorry about that. Uh, what tests should patients undergo if severe asthma and COPD overlap syndrome is suspected? Did you hear the question, uh, Dr. Lemire? Is it what step? Uh, what what, what step? test? What test? Patients undergo. Oh, what test? Sorry. 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 <laughs> uh, well, I, oh, sorry. Um, well, actually, when, if you think that she, there is both, I mean, that's really the same kind of test. That means you need to have um, complete PFTs, um, you know, to to try to understand why what is mostly related to asthma, uh, related to COPD. And also, uh, you have to appreciate the level of airway inflammation to see whether, um, you know, this uh, anti-eosinophilic medication could be used. Uh, so basically, I, I would say that is the, the, the same type of medication. Probably, maybe, I don't know, it depends, you know, it really uh, it depends on the case. But for example, you may want to look at, uh, to perform a CT scan to see whether there is emphysema, for example. Uh, if, you know, emphysema is prominent, well, it's going to change probably uh, the way you're going to treat the disease. So basically, it's the same, but maybe uh, I would add probably CT scan. Okay, thank you. And a question uh, from Bill. What about neutrophilic asthma? Anything in the pipeline? Yeah, neutrophilic asthma, uh, that was a bit disappointing for the moment. I mean, there, there was some trial uh, with anti io 17 or uh, anti uh, interferon alpha gamma, but he has a lot of side effects. And actually, the thing is that the neutrophils are very, very useful to fight. Uh, infections. So, you know, it's something to target the eosinophils, destroy the eosinophils, which are not as useful in real life. For example, uh, you know, they, 
they are useful if you have a lot of parasitic infection, for example, which is not really our concern here. Um, but neutral fields, we need neutral fields to fight uh, infection. So um, the medication that they tried actually had a lot of side effects in terms of infection and sometimes malignant and, and in some cases malignancy. So unfortunately for the moment, uh, I am not aware of you know any really effective medication that would come to the market in the near future. Thank you. So I do have a, a couple more questions, but I do thank you for your patience, everyone, uh, and Dr. Lemire. So a question from Leslie. Will any of these drugs help with asthma-inducted COPD as I am a chronic asthmatic from childhood till now at 65 years old? Well, again, you know, this, this if you, we, we are talking about the biologic, the biologic are uh, being tested in COPD. So um, there are some patients with COPD who still exhibit airway inflammation. So that may be uh, effective in this really small population. That's possible. Um, so far, I haven't seen the, the results of the, the, the COPD trial, but you know, it's really driven by uh, the level of, of, of airway inflammation. If you really have high airway inflammation, a lot of exacerbation, if, even if you have a bit of COPD, it should work. Uh, if you have just a bit of airway inflammation, it's not going to be very effective. Thank you. Another question from Bill. What about reported uh, serum reactions to uh, Zolaire? Um, yeah, well, the, there was severe, uh, well, some, some severe cases of anaphylaxis with Zolaire. Um, I think with all this medication, it is a potential side effect. It's still very rare. Um, but it has to be monitored, and uh, people need to be cautious. Uh, but that's, you know, that's a, that's a potential side effect with this type of medication. But it's rare, though. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have a question from Martin uh, in, the, in the English one. Uh, how can we know which phenotype we have, which test? Is it a blood test? Yeah, well, there is a blood test. It's just... Uh, uh, you know, a regular blood test with the uh, uh, a form that we, you know, um, a, a blood cell count. Uh, but you know, the thing is that it is even it's what they consider being an indication to start the treatment is often between normal limits. Um, so usually, if you have point, I would say point four or higher. Um, eosinophils in the uh, the blood cell count, uh, along with really frequent asthma exacerbation, that is an indication to use this treatment. Um, but I think looking, we do a lot of uh, sputum cell count, so you know we have we have the the, the patient speed and we analyze the secretion. Uh, I think that this is much more specific for airway inflammation and it's more reliable. So if you have a lot of airway eosinophil, you know, that's where the problem is. So um, that's this, for me, I rely more on this test, but it's not available everywhere. Uh, so, uh, you know, blood cell count is a surrogate for, for that, but it's not as precise as the other. Thank you. And a question from Dia. Um, do you know of any programs or which programs might be available to help with the cost of biologics? Yeah, well, usually uh, the kind of program are offered by the companies. So, you know, I can't, I, I, I don't know how it's, uh, it's done in other provinces. In Quebec, when you uh, you want to start the medication, you do, you, you write a prescription to, and it's through a program offered uh, by the company. So you, you, you send a fax and um, it's handled by the company, uh, which going to see with your private insurer or with the government. Um, and 
you, they, they can offer uh, also to pay your part, depending on the patient, uh, to pay on the part of the medication. When Nucala first uh, uh, was first on the ma market, the company was paying completely the drug until it was reimbursed. So it really needs to be seen with the company because they have program to, to pay for that. Because I didn't actually, I forgot to, to mention that, but it's extremely expensive. It's around $20,000 per year per, per patient. So that is extremely expensive medication. Yes, <laughs> very much so. Thank you. Well, one more question from Dia then just in relation. If you would know how patients might be able to get access to severe asthma clinics, well, I guess they, they, they need to be uh, referred to their family physician. Uh, there are these, these clinics probably uh, ever in Canada, you know, in, in main centers. For example, in Ontario, they have uh, a very good one uh, in Firestone Clinic in Hamilton. Uh, I'm sure in, in Toronto also. Uh, it's really, you know, I guess in, in the academic centers, um, the, the chest department has uh, a, a severe asthma clinic. Uh, you know, it's probably the case it's in, in Ottawa, it's the case in Calgary, it's the case in Vancouver. Uh, but obviously, you know, depending where you live, it can be uh, uh, a bit far away. In Kingston, they have one. So, uh, you know, it's for, for, we, we have patients uh, who travel, for example, I have I, I'm following patients from Gatineau, uh, you know, which is a, a two-hour drive from Montreal, uh, and even pe people uh, up north. You know, that's not ideal, especially when we want to do a close follow-up. Um, but um, so the referral should be done through the, the family physician. I think it's probably the easiest. Great. Thank you. We have three more questions, so we'll try to get those in the next two minutes. A question from Carrie. Is there an FEV1 lung function, lung function threshold, high and low, for biologic use? If lung function is not always improved by biologics, could patients with higher FEV1 but uncontrolled asthma benefit? Well, actually, it's not a criteria. Lung function is not a criteria for, uh, for prescription of biology. Uh, it's really... Uh, the exacerbation and the inflammation, um, because what the, the, the drug is going to decrease a lot inflammation, but sometimes uh, the effect on lung function is small. So it shouldn't be a, a target of there shouldn't be a threshold to administer this medication. Uh, you know, if it if it gets better, good. But you know, I have, for example, I have a patient who was treated with Zoller. She has a really a miserable TV one, very, very low. And, but she was taking prednisone, I think, every month. And since she has started this medication, her TV one is, is still not very good and very low, but she hasn't had one exacerbation. She hasn't taken one time uh, the, the prednisone. So I would say, you know, if she had better... Uh, uh, airway function that would be good, but you know, the important thing is that she stop having exacerbation. So uh, I don't think we should put focus too much on uh, on FEV1 because it's not this drug is not a bronchodilator; it's really an inflammatory medication. Okay, thank you. A question uh, then for Mike: Is there a connection between Zolaire and blood clots? And blood clots? And blood clots. Uh, no, not am I, I am aware of. Okay, thank you. And then a last question uh, from Bill. Do they do uh, sputnum inofils in Quebec? In Quebec City? Or I think he, he might be asking of the whole province. Uh, yes. Uh, if you go to Quebec City, have one, uh, we do that. Uh, as a routine, on a routine basis in uh, Sacré-Cœur Hospital. Uh, they do it also at the Jewish Hospital in Montreal. Uh, and uh, so centers in Montreal and um, Quebec City. Uh, I'm not sure about Sherbrooke. I think uh, they were, we, we, uh, we trained people in Trois-Rivières, so I don't know if their lab is up and running, but uh, uh, 
they have been trained. So, you know, obviously it's a limited number of centers, unfortunately, but, um, but you know, the, the big cities, they, they should be able to do it. Great. Okay. Well, we are now at the end of our time. So again, a, a very big thank you, Dr. Lemire. Um, we definitely appreciate you taking the time uh, to give us this presentation. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, if at any point uh, you have any further questions, uh, please email us at info at asthma.ca, and we'll be happy to help. Again, thank you, and have a great and hopefully uh, not too cold uh, Tuesday afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.